All right. Can we go to scripture and I want to enter in through what you've been sharing last week because these are the verses that, uh, you know, as a leader of the church, I know sometimes we handle a series of teaching and a series of messages and I want to pledge myself right into what you're dealing with in Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. And as they look for that, uh, our church in Nairobi is called Life Church International. Um, this evening, uh, 6 o'clock, which will be like 10 a.m. in Nairobi, we stream our services live on Facebook. So if you go, those of you on Facebook, uh, Life Church International, and like, then you can watch the service. Uh, I'll be doing that myself because I want to know what's going on. And so seeing who is not dancing, you know, and so forth. And you can also watch some of the messages I do on YouTube. If you Google uh, David Juma, you'll find our messages on YouTube uh, that we air on one of our national televisions every Thursday night as we minister to the body of Christ in our region. Second Timothy, that's great. We're going to read a lot of verses, I warn you. So you need to find a place to place those verses. Either write them down as you get along in Jesus' name. For Demas has done what? Because he loved this world, he has deserted me and has gone to the Salonica. Which version is that, brother? If you can find the New King James to help me, uh, it's the one I'm used to. It's not holier than the others, but it's just one of the good verses that I'm used to. Amen. And if you can allow me to hear myself through this monitor, so that it's not here for nothing, so it can work. God bless you. Uh, Demas has forsaken me, Paul says, and has loved this present world. That's interesting. Uh, We'll be looking at this word, world. What did he love? Uh, and as we consider that, let's read another verse just to put them together. In the first letter of John, chapter number 2, and verse 15, 16, and 17. First John 2, verse 15. To 17, the Bible says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And 16, for all that is in the world, what is in the world? The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. 17. And the world passeth away, the last thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. Mm. Lord, may you bless your word and your people in Jesus' name. One of the greatest messages that we've received from this house and this ministry is the message of love. The first time I met John, I had an encounter as he was speaking and speaking and speaking. Uh, in 2006, in his house, I had to pick my laptop and begin to write the things I was hearing. And I could liken him to the John in the Bible. So great love and life and grace. And which is part of the message of his life, together uh, as a demonstration of the apostolic ministry. So the greatest message in this house has been the message of the love of God and the love for one another. But listen, where the love of God could be lacking, just in case love is lacking, it will go without saying that then the love of the world becomes the new attraction 
either you are loving God or if you are not loving God the Father and doing his will, something else will replace that as a new competition or challenge which is love of the world. The scripture talks about Demas. Demas. It's not a demon but it's Demas, right? He was part of the teams, I mean part of the team of Paul, all the men that walked with Paul. One time there's a little book I wrote called How to Begin in Ministry and on one of the little pages for young people, I had a list of almost 30 men and women who worked with Paul. Tychicus, Sospaters, Epaphroditus, Epaphras, Cyrus, ah, Luke, and so forth. So many names. Some of them are strange. Demas, I have to go and check whether I included his name because he left the ministry. But there was a young man who left, John Mark. Later, Paul says, ah, bring him back. Bring him to me because he's profitable, you know, for ministry or to ministry. And he has learned his lesson. So now you can bring him back. But what is this that Demas loved? As I speak this morning uh, on what I'm calling love, not the world. Everybody say, I will not love the world. I want you to notice that the greatest challenge and competition that we have or we get in our love for the Father and doing the will of God, the greatest competition is the arar, which sometime in Kenya we pronounce arur, of loving the world or the things of the world. And the scriptures in the first John chapter 2 verse 15, 16, 17 is saying, however, if you do the will of the Father, then you will live forever. But if you love the world, then as the world is passing away, you will also pass away. But if you love the Father and do his will, you will live forever. And I believe this morning we have people that are ready to live with God forever. And not join the company of those that are loving the world. And the world, when the world is passing away, then you'll pass away with the world. I don't want you and I to be part of that company. But what is this world? that we are called not to love. There are two Greek words that are used in the New Testament for world, and there are a couple of scriptures. One of the Greek words is the word aion, which simply talks about the age or, you know, the world, a specific period of time, like age, cause of the world, and actually there are certain verses where this word is interpreted as ever, you know, forever, ever, and ever. Just age, the word aion, world without end. So, do not love this present age, this age, this world, meaning the things in that age. There's a second word, which is the word cosmos, which is familiar, which has several meanings. In the Greek, almost seven meanings. But generally is an ordinary arrangement. It means an ordinary arrangement. Decoration, what you find on the earth. Including its inhabitants or the inhabitants of the world. The adorning of the world. But out of all those meanings, there's one particular one for cosmos in the strong I want to bring out, which is Meaning world affairs, cosmos as world affairs, the aggregate of things earthly, the whole circle of earthly goods, endowments, all the riches, advantages, all the pleasures of the world. And this word, cosmos, in its definition, adds that. This world's riches and pleasures and advantages are hollow. They are frail. They are fleeting. 
They stir desires. They seduce from God. And are obstacles to the cause of Christ. So if you love these riches, these pleasures, these endowments, these advantages and pursue them and desire them, you will soon find you're creating a barrier, an obstacle to the desire of Christ and the cause of Christ, the cosmos. Mm. So it's not just the physical earth and the stones and the rocks, but the moral aspect of this earth. So this world which we are not to love, John in the first John, if you can keep the verse, chapter 2 and verse 15 on the screen, the scripture says, love not the world. It gives us three things in that world that we should not love. And I'm sure uh, you may have handled this before, but just like Paul says, for me to write to you the same thing I did before, it doesn't break a bone. So it's good to hear the same thing. And by the way, good preaching is preaching the same thing. Okay, you didn't hear that. And Jesus repeated himself many times, and especially 500 times on certain subjects. So let's hear it again. I know my English is a Kenyan English. Yours is Australian. So when these two English meet, there is an explosion. All right. What are the three things mentioned in this verse that are in the world? Which verse is that, brother? Okay. So, verse 16. You know, the software I used back in Nairobi, they throw just one verse on the screen, so that's okay. These days the Bible has left our hands. It's gone to the walls. God have mercy. May the Bible return to your palms. It's now on the world. Huh. That's why you didn't carry one. The last of the flesh. Number two, the last of the eyes. Number three, the pride of life. So when you consider this world that we should not love, these three things are major. Lasts of the flesh, of the eyes, and the pride of life. Ah, pride of life. What kind of life? There are several words for life. This is not the divine life or zoe life. No. This refers to the state of being alive. Uh... You know, it's not just the state of being alive, rather the things in the world that make life possible. For example, when you talk about the pride of life, for example, in First John chapter 3, verse 17, there's a word there used that if anyone who has these wow's goods and sees his brother in need, chapter 3, verse 17, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So the scripture uses the same word, world's goods. That word goods is the life we are talking about in the pride of life. Jesus uses the same word in Mark chapter 12, verse 44. When he was talking about this poor widow who came and brought an offering, uh, right there and Jesus was standing in Mark 12, 44. And Jesus said, she put in everything she heard, her whole living, her whole living, so her goods. So the phrase pride of life means pride in what you possess. Mm. The things you have. Ah. Well, I'm just defining these things. I'm still going to shoot. Don't worry. I'm still going to shoot. Ah. Uh. But I'm just trying to define words. Now, when we look at these three descriptions that are in the world, let's look at how they relate to one another. The first two, the last of the flesh and the last of the eyes, refer to the desires for what we don't have. Uh, we desire what we don't have. So last of the flesh, last of the eyes, refers to the desires of those things that we do not have. But the third one, pride of life, refers to the pride in what we do have. Because I tell you what, when you have certain things that you really like and admire, 
you are likely to be a little bit proud because of what you have. And the scriptures are saying, do not love this world. Meaning, if we begin to love and just admire and desire and be caught up in what we have, we will soon discover that we are moving away from the love of the Father. So the world is driven by these two things because the first two and the last one. These two things. One, passion for pleasure. Today's world is driven by what? Passion for pleasure. Everybody wants some pleasure. Number two, the world is being driven by pride in possessions. Mm. Pride in possessions. But the scriptures are saying, ladies and gentlemen, that, and children, we must be careful, not just be caught up in desiring something that you haven't acquired and you're so caught up in pursuing that, or so prideful because of what you do have, because that will be of the world. Rather, we need to love the Father to such a great extent that we are willing to do the will of the Father. Then we shall live forever. Now, let's go through some few verses that help us build this matter. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll read from verse 1 very quickly to verse 4. And begin to hear what the Bible says about these matters of the allure to the things of the world. And you had he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's good. You and I have been made alive. That's a divine encounter. Listen to verse 2. Wherein in time past, we walked according to the course of this world. Did you hear that? According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love in which he loved us. Then we begin the great journey of how we receive salvation by grace. Notice all this is in the past, describing the life of somebody who has not been transformed who's not been born again, who's not come into Christ, who was dead in sins and dead in trespasses. And this is a situation and the condition of somebody who has not received Christ. He is dead, walking dead in trespasses and sins. But not only that, he was not only dead, or we were not only dead, those of us, before we received Christ, but we also walked according to the course of this world, meaning... Lust of the flesh was no more. Lust of eyes was no more. Pride of life was no more. And not only that, according to the scripture in verse 2 and 3, the Bible shows that the prince of the power of the air controlled us. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Meaning, there's a spirit, the prince of of the power of the air that controls the world. There's another scripture, we'll not go there now, but it says that the God of this world, small g, has blinded the eyes of those who do not believe that they might not see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. There is a God of this world that has blinded the eyes of many. There's a prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works now in the children of disobedience, but praise God, if you're 
loving the Father, walking in Christ, having a relationship with God, and taking your firm ground in the Word of God, then the Spirit, the Prince of the power of air, is no longer controlling you. Mm. But unless there is that receiving in verse 4 of these Ephesians 2 that says, but God was rich in mercy, in his love, in which he loved us. Praise God that by grace we have been saved. Look at another verse that Paul gives to us that mentions and talks about this world. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, there's a call, the Bible says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Romans 12, verse 2, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. There's a call from Paul the Apostle saying, we should not be conformed to this world. We should not be attached. We should not be held captive. We should not be pursuing and following just the things of this world, but rather something else should happen. We should be transformed. There should be a change. There should be a metamorphosis. There should be a journey as we look into the word, as we study the word, as we allow God's word to change our lives will be transformed so that now we are no longer under the power of the prince of the power of the air who controls the world. Rather, the word of God has changed us, has renewed our mind. And guess what? Now we come to a place we are able to prove, to know the will of God, the good will of God, the acceptable will of God, and the perfect will of God transformation how i pray that all of us will give ourselves to the word so that transformation can continue in our lives now the scripture also talks about something in the book of james james the apostle you can see that it's not only john that talks about this matter paul talks about it and james chapter 4 verse 4 maybe we can read james chapter 4 verse uh, the rain is a sign of blessing. So your blessings are not only coming through here, they are also coming from above. Receive both. Come on. Nod your head like you are receiving. Like this. All right. James 4. Read verse. All right. Instead of going back to verses 1, it says, where do wars come from? You guys, when you keep on warring with each other, pushing each other, uh, you know, where is that wisdom coming from? It does not come from the Father, and so forth and so forth. But now, just keep num number four, verse four, because of time. He says, Ye under trust and under terraces, know ye not that the friendship of the world is an enmity with God. That's very serious. That friendship with the world is an enmity with God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Lily, is this verse in the Bible? So, friendship with the world will interfere with your fellowship with God. This is what James is saying. When an enmity with God kicks in, of friendship with the world kicks in. That means we are enemies of God. And that means we lose our connection with our loving Father. And then we become exposed to the spirit that is controlling the world. The prince of the power of the air. So what is a call? The Holy Spirit is calling us, ladies and gentlemen, to keep our friendship with God and not friendship with the world. Having said that from the New Testament, just a couple of the verses, I want us to go through a journey quickly in a couple of minutes and look at some verses in the Old Testament. In the book of Numbers, and this one I'm going to come down. Can I come down? As long as I don't go out, right? With these mics, you can go anywhere. In the book of Numbers, there was a time in the journey of Israel, moving from Egypt to the promised land, the Bible shows us 
that they stopped at a place near Moab. And Numbers 22, 23, and Numbers 24 is a very interesting story there of how Balak, the king of Moab, hired Balaam to curse God's people Israel. Do you remember? Ah, I like the way you remember. You are there, I think. Uh, uh, some of you have been living for many years. Okay. But anyway, we saw it in the Bible. So, Balak hired Balaam to curse God's people. And Balaam asked Balak to prepare, first time, seven altars, seven sacrifices. He did it three times. So, in other words, Balak prepared 21 altars and sacrifices. That's a huge demonic sacrifice. So that Balaam could curse God's people. Do you remember in chapter 23, God will not allow Balaam to curse God's people. Because whom God has blessed, you can't curse. For the blessing is greater than a curse. In fact, in the days of Nehemiah, when they were talking about, you remember Nehemiah built the wall, then later he went back to Babylon, and he came back in chapter 13 to check how things were going on, and then he found the guys who were troubling him in chapter 4, Sanballat and Tobias. Do you remember them? This time, they had been allowed to take some rooms that were supposed to be part of the treasury uh, of God's people, where they're supposed to be keeping tithes and offerings, and Tobiah had hired the place and, and Nehemiah was very mad and threw them out. And he was saying these people, part of the group that tried to curse us, just like Balaam tried to curse God's people, but the blessing was greater than a curse. So Balaam could not be allowed by God to curse God's people. Listen to me carefully. In chapter 23 and 24, we have all that story right there. And because Balaam was a strange diviner and strange sorcerer, strange prophet, and he was a bit accurate. And we know, we're not teaching on the prophetics right now, but we know accuracy in prophetic ministry doesn't mean that one is a good prophet. There's another measure that measures prophecy and prophets. That's another message for another day. But Balak was frustrated that his hired prophet could not curse God's people. In chapter 25, could you go there, brother? In chapter 25, there seems to have been some strange, worldly wisdom that was shared with Balak and his people Moab on what they should do to let God himself curse the people. Read this with me, 25, and see what happened. Numbers 25, from verse 1. It's coming, it's on the way, here it goes. And Israel bowed in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Ah, verse 2, quickly, verse 2. And they called the people unto the sacrifice of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed to their gods. What happened? And Israel joined himself unto Baal, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. What happened? And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. Uh huh. Let's read all the way to nine. And Moses said unto all the judges of Israel, Stay, I mean, slay every one his men that were joined unto Baal. Uh huh. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who are weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. What happened? Next verse. And when Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. I like this man. And he went after the men of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the men of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. What was going on here? Israel began to 
intermarry Israel boys and began to go across the border and get the women of Moab and they began to commit all kinds of sins and the Bible says that thing opened a door and Israel began to suffer and a plague came up. So though Balaam could not curse God's people, there was something else that exposed Israel to a curse. It is loving the world, connecting themselves with the people of Moab. Look at the next verse. And those that died in the plague were how many? 20 and 4,000. Balaam could kill nobody. But as soon as these people began to intermarry and mix themselves up with Moab, a door was opened and a plague came and Israel suffered. Touch your neighbor say, love not the world. Okay, let me try again. Touch your neighbor. No, don't touch. Just look at them and say, love not the world. Ah, love not the world. Ah. Let's go to another verse. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, we have a very interesting story. It's not really a story, but a song. It begins in Deuteronomy 31. Towards the end, God tells Moses to sing a song. And then in chapter 32, there is a song that begins, a beautiful hymn. Down in verse 16. Let's go 32, verse 16. You hear part of the stanzas of this song and hear what Moses is saying. How I pray that everyone before you are gathered with your fathers, God will give you an assignment to sing a song and also tell of his wondrous works that he has done over the years. So this is part of the stanzas of the song. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations they provoked him to anger. Ah, next verse 17. Look at what they did Israel. Next verse. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, ah, whom your fathers feared not. Hold there, hold there, brother. If you look at this verse in another version, it says, new God, new arrivals. So Israel connected itself or herself to new arrival gods, new gods. What happened? Two more verses. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, what happened? He abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. So when Israel connected themselves in terms of what we're calling loving the world, new arrivals, new gods. I believe here in Australia we have new arrival gods. Yeah. May the Holy Spirit begin to open our eyes and show us what are these new gods, new arrivals, newly up. Things that we give our time, we give our energy, and things that we pledge ourselves into until God is put at the periphery. New arrival gods. May God help us. I don't want to talk about social media. I don't want to talk about Facebook, what's up, what's not up, and Instagram and whatever, because they could be part of the new arrivals. Uh-huh. And how much time we are spending. God have mercy. Because it will provoke the Lord. Because if we do not have time to love him and to do his will, we'll be caught up in things in the world. I'm not saying you don't send me a message. No, 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 you go ahead and send me a message. I'll be waiting. Mm. Let me quickly move out of here, but go to Hosea. Hosea, book of Hosea, chapter 4. And here, anybody who attaches himself to the world, look at what Hosea says, chapter 4, verse 17. Just one verse. 
If we get connected with the things of the world this way, there will be a trouble. There will be problems. Hosea 4.17 says, Ephraim has joined himself to idols. Let him alone. Leave him alone. In other words, if God was to do anything for you, but you have attached yourself to the things of the world like idols, God will back off. Let him alone. Leave him alone. You're on your own. Ha. Huh. And in many other places, the scriptures talks about these things. Very quickly, look at Jesus himself. What did Jesus face? Uh, Jesus Christ faced these things too. But God helped him in a big way because he was also God. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus himself faced this prince of the power of the air, Satan himself, in the Gospels. Go with me to Luke chapter 4. The Gospel of Luke chapter 4 from verse 1. And look at how Jesus confronted or faced the three temptations, which are lined up with the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, the pride of life. Would you want to read that with me? Luke chapter 4 verse 1, the Bible says, and Jesus was full of what? The Holy Ghost, right? Ghost. Somebody was asking me, what's the difference between ghost and spirit? I said, ghost is an old word, but anyway, it's only in Christianity where we have Holy Ghost. In other religions, they have ghosts. But in Christianity, we have the Holy Ghost. And our Holy Ghost is the ghost of other ghosts. All right. You didn't get it. You'll get it next year. So he was full of the Holy Ghost. And returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Where? Into the wilderness. Let's read on. In into the Holy Spirit. Verse 2. The Bible says, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. I, I don't like this version. But anyway, that's the only one you have. Eh? I wanted a new one. But anyway, it's okay. He was hungry after 40 days of prayer and fasting. I mean, when you are hungry after 40 days, I mean, after 40 days, you'll be hungry. Even after two, three days fasting, you'll be hungry. Come on. The other day, we were taking our church through seven days of prayer and fasting without food in the church. Seven days. No food, no fasting, no tea, no coffee. Uh, only water. And we were praying during the day and at night we had teams praying. So seven days of prayer. I tell you what. We were hungry after seven days. Jesus was also hungry. We were trying to push stuff in the spirit. Read the next verse. Let's see what happened. And the devil said to him, Ah, this is the first one. If thou art a son of God, command this stone that it may be made bread. Because seriously, this matter of appetite, of food and eating was a major issue. But how did Jesus overcome this one? Because last of the flesh is not just in matters immoral, but also issues of appetites and things that you can crave for that will push you outside the plan of God. Jesus answered us saying, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from his mouth. Glory to God. He, say, he says, It is written. It is written. Everybody say, It is written. You need to find what is written to deal with this matter. What is written in the word. It is written. Quickly. The next verse. Another temptation. And the devil taking up on the high mountain. And showed him. So this has to do with what you see. Showed him. Uh, the, all the kingdoms of the world. In a moment of time. Showed him. There are things you see. You don't want to have them. But you desire them. You crave for them. And if these things are going to push you outside the plan of God in your life, you need to be careful. I too need to be careful. So he showed him. What happened? And the devil said unto him, All this power I give thee and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me and whosoever I wish to give. All right. Here is Jesus and the devil. L let me say something. I discovered in life and ministry, anybody... That has a great destiny. 
anybody that is going anywhere with God in the future will not turn and in to meet Jesus, but also meet the devil. Okay. Sela. Sela or Sela? Pull something. So here, after the devil said this, next verse. If thou therefore will worship me, all it will be yours. He is looking for worship. These are the things I got. If you worship me, they will be yours. What did Jesus do? He said, Jesus said, answered, I said, get behind me, Satan, for it is written. Again, it is written. Ah, you shall only worship God. Listen, one time I had an encounter in Nairobi when the ministry was young and we were looking for a place to place to hire a hall to do church because in Kenya, every, anything called a hall has a church. In this space, you can never think about as church. And so we didn't have space. So one time I was looking and we were praying. Then the Lord showed me a vision. And I met the prince of the power of the air who controls Nairobi. He was a huge guy dressed like a prince with 12 men, all with goggles and black, black suits and looking good security. And the guy could point at a building and it became his. He points at another building, it became his. He points at a building, it became his. I said, wow, this guy has buildings everywhere. So I went to him, I said, hey, would you allow me or rent to me one of the floors of one of your buildings? I want to do church. He said, no problem. Then he said, on one condition, that you worship our God. Then the name of his God showed up on the screen. 25 letters, you couldn't even pronounce that name. I discovered, uh oh. So in the dream, in the vision, he began walking away when he told me I worship his God. But, but there's something I, I believe. Anytime you're dreaming or seeing a vision or seeing anything, don't agree to lose in that thing, in whatever you're saying. That, oh, you're dreaming and you're going into a hole and you have entered into a hole and you have disappeared and you didn't come back. No. It should end when you are coming back because you have victory in Christ. Okay. So I shouted to him. I said, hey, I can't worship your God. My Jesus will deal with you. And the guy disappeared. Within a few days, my car got into an accident. I got into a bus from behind. Bang. And lifted the bus like a jack. Cut the windscreens, but I was not touched. And then I discovered, uh oh, the prince is now beginning to test powers. And the guy had told me, oh, I own the whole of this avenue. I own the other avenue. You can get anything you want on this one condition. I said, no, I'm not going to worship your God. So we knew all of a sudden, this is the power we are dealing with in the city. And through prayers and declarations and fastings and all the things God helped us to do in that warfare, now as we talk, we are in that avenue. God gave us a building in that avenue and that power has been destroyed and now we are worshiping Jesus from the street of Nairobi right in the place where he was saying he can't give us. So Jesus said this is written. Tell your neighbor, you also need to tell him it is written. It is written. Look at, let's look at the last one. The next verse. And then he brought him to Jerusalem. Wow, the big city. And he took him to the pinnacle of the temple. What? Pinnacle of what? The temple. Ah, what is the pinnacle? The highest place in the temple. That's where he put him. I said, if you're a son of God, throw yourself down. And then Satan began to quote the Psalms, Psalms 91, saying, For it is written, he shall uh, give you angels, and they shall take charge over thee and keep thee. Next verse. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest you dash thy foot against a stone. This, this verse, uh, the devil did not uh, quote it correctly. He jumped a sentence if you go to Psalms. That's your homework because we have no time. Go check the Psalms. And check what is written here. You discover the devil was very crafty. He jumped a certain area that says, and he will keep you in all your ways. How could he say that? And he's trying to test him. Anyhow, what did Jesus say in the next verse? 
Jesus answered saying, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. In other words, Jesus was saying, I'm your God. You don't tempt your God. I'm your God. You don't tempt your God. It is written. If you keep telling the devil it is written, he will also leave you. He told him three times it's written. If you keep telling the devil it's written, he will also leave you. Now I see my time is almost over and I'm not over. So we're going to summarize this quickly and pray in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody say, I will not love the world. Everybody say, I will love the Father and I will do his will and over truth I will live forever. Over truth I will live forever. Jesus dealt with the enemy, the devil, in these three temptations. And he set an example for us and a pattern for us. Kind of saying, we too can win this battle. And we can walk away from loving the world and begin to love our father. Jesus did it. We can do it. And we will do it. Uh, I know we, have also, we also have desires. We also desire, of course, if you desire a good car, that's great. You desire a good house, that's great. You desire a good job, that's good. You don't have it, but you desire. You desire a good family, that's good. I'm sure there are people here who desire some good things. Is the law saying never desire anything? No. What's going on is this. If we ever desire anything, let it be that that thing we will use it to the glory and the praise of God. If anything that we desire comes our way to keep us far from God and his love, then that thing will become to us like an idol. We are loving the world. Uh, many verses we can't finish, but just read this one. Psalms 73. Just read this one. Verse 25. Then we'll read one more and then we pray. Psalms 73, verse 25. The Bible says, Whom have I in heaven? But you. And there is nothing upon the earth. Did you get it? 73 verse 25. It's on the way. It's coming. Whom have I in heaven but thee? There's none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Read that out and loud. One, two, go. Whom have I? So I don't desire anything else but him. That means anything that comes near me, anything that comes to my hand, anything that is given to me by God, anything must not surpass the desire I have for him. If I get a house, then that house has to align itself in me serving God, worshiping God, doing God's will with that thing. Are you listening? If you get a job, if Look, Jesus, I mean, the New Testament tells us these things. Uh, we don't have time to, to go there, but I tell you what, in everything you do, do it for the glory of God, the Bible says. Ah, if you ever boast, on a boast in the Lord, glory to God. What do you have? First Corinthians 4, 7. What do you have that you did not receive? Or if you received it, why do you boast as though it was not a gift? Let him who boasts Verse 7, boast in the Lord. In other words, anything that comes our way, anything we receive from God, anything we receive from anywhere, though we desired it. I know Psalms that 7, oh, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Praise God. But when he gives you, you don't lose him and begin to pursue the thing. Rather, you maintain your focus and your connection with the Father. 
so that anything called by our name serves our God. Huh. There's a great man they called St. Augustine. He said a very powerful statement. He said in one of his prayers, He loves thee too little who loves anything together with thee, which he loves not for thy sake. Let me read that again. He loves thee too little who loves anything together with thee, which he loves not for thy sake. So if we are loving God together with something else, then we are loving God too little. Wow. Let's begin to say, God, I will love you more than anything else. This is a call of God. Amen? Okay. Just bow your head. Let's begin to pray. Uh, let's take the five minutes of a preacher to pray. And just believe God that this call that he's given us to not love the world but to love him will be the greatest call of our life. Father, we give you praise. Father, we give you glory. Just bow your heart and pray to God. And say, Father, I will love you more than anything else. I will love you more than anything else. I'll give you praise. I'll give you glory. I give you honor. I bless your name. I exhort you, Jesus. I glorify your name. I will love you more than anything, Jesus. I give you praise. I give you glory. I give you honor. You are mighty Jesus. You are glorious God. You are mighty Jesus. You are great I am. You are greater. Greater than anything God. Blessed be your name Jesus. I give you praise. Bless your holy name, Father. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. One more time, bow your heart before him and tell him, I will love you and I'm ready to do your will. And Jesus, I give you praise. Jesus, I give you praise. If you find you've loved something, held on to something that is hindering your walk with God, let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. Anything, any appetite, huh? and the things that you desire, they haven't come to you yet, but you're kind of so sold out to those things, but they are not in line with God's word. Let go. The Lord will lead you there. Even as you walk with him. The Bible says seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And all these other things shall be added unto you. Father I give you praise.